I'm Adam Bocolo, and welcome to Stories Behind the Grind podcast. To kick off episode one, I interviewed Justin of Reiterate Media. Justin left his digital marketing manager role to shake up the marketing industry. We discussed the importance of personal development, marketing advice for new business owners, and what to look for when hiring staff. So Justin, welcome to Stories Behind the Grind, podcast number one. Great to have you here on the show. Before we get into it, would you just want to tell the community a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Firstly, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, it's a privilege to be on the very first one and to uh, talk a little bit more about Reiterate and what we do. So. I guess a little bit about myself, I started off as um, uh, in marketing, I was the digital marketing manager for for Personalised Plates Queensland. Uh, After working there for four years I decided that I wanted to branch out, start my own agency and try and shake up an industry which has largely remained relatively unchanged in the way that people go about doing it. You know, I wanted to create an agency that really focused on results for clients and not one that was just using cookie cutter approaches, you know. Is that what you found PPQ? doing using a sort of a cookie cutter approach in their format and that's why you wanted to branch out and and do your own thing? I don't so much know if it was PPQ specifically, like they were doing a lot of advanced level marketing activity, we had a really strong management team. Uh, It was more so there was a lot of inefficiencies in in, in the chain and getting things the way that we wanted it uh, could be difficult at times. Uh, And I identified that I thought there were ways that I might be able to make things more efficient and make things easier and most importantly make things more cost efficient for people. I wanted to try allow small businesses uh, and medium sized and large businesses to have that same high level marketing strategy that you know previously agencies were charging tens of thousands of dollars to achieve. I guess working previously in the marketing industry you obviously built up your skill base before starting your own, own endeavour. What skills have you relied on now that you sort of formed and built upon previously? Mm. Look, uh, uh, throughout my entire life, I've always focused on on learning. I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss. I'm a big fan of his, he, the methodologies that he used to try learn things as quick as possible. So I've developed these skills over a, a long period of time through experimentation, trial and error, and finding what um, you know what matches my personality the most. So I guess the main skills at the moment that I, I rely on really is you know, one thing if I, if I don't know how to do it research you know if I, I keep reading staying up to date with the latest in, in news to ensure that any strategy that I'm suggesting is cutting edge another one of the skills that we commonly use of course and this is what a skill everyone needs is networking and the ability to leverage off your connections and the ability to make new connections and meet people and and see you know form these mutually beneficial relationships you know really looking for win-wins Everyone out there is trying to achieve the same thing. They're trying to achieve happiness. They're trying to achieve wealth. And if you can find ways that you can both mutually support each other, that's the perfect kind of, you know, arrangement. And and they are easy to create, provided that you're using the right mindset to go about and create them. Other than that, I think, you know, remaining creative, you know, remaining out of the box thinking and the ability to separate your emotions and, and remain rational. I think there's a lot of times where people in business get bogged down in, in the emotion and there's, it's such a turbulent ride. People can lose that ability to think really rationally and make quick fire rational decisions based on what's presented in front of you. What's your advice for those say, business owners that are getting stuck in that position? How do they take a, a higher level approach, I guess? to have that bird's eye view of the business as opposed to getting bogged down in the details and worried about uh, the day-to-day runnings and having a sort of strategic direction? Mm. I think uh, one of the things that's really helped me is a focus on personal development. So the, what I learned through trying to become you know, a better person, trying to learn ways that I can manage to control the emotions, the negative emotions that I feel, ways that I control my you know, anxiety, ways that I um, can make sure that I'm making decisions based on Um, you know, rational inputs, that really helps me then run the business. So I think for me, and that's what we try to achieve with Reiterate, is providing people the information that helps them, you know, improve both personally and through that journey of trying to, of self-improvement, you improve the way that you operate and the way that you run your business. Um, You know, and then there are a number of tools to be able to do that. I mean, meditation is an obvious one. uh, And that's one that's been really helpful for me because, you know, we were having that discussion before we started this podcast about if you're not allowing your mind to be clear, then that's how you start to get stuck in the chaos of the day. You know, meditation is a way of, of keeping yourself really calm and keeping yourself, having the ability to process things accurately. And then the next level of that is to have a system. So, you know, for myself, it's whenever I think of something, I'm writing it down. Once it's all on paper, 
and it's out of your head, then it's a lot easier to manage. So when you have it all on paper, then you can look at all the different inputs and then you can start to prioritise. You know, just taking that step by step, it's a step approach. Now, you know, instead of going, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed, I've got 10,000 things to think about, stop, create the list, all of a sudden you realise it's not 10,000, it's 60. And then when you go through the 60, you just start listing them in order, one mm -hmm. to 60 of the most, you know, most important first, least important 60, and just start crossing them off. And as you're going through that list, you might have other ones added in and just add it in. And I'm constantly just working off lists because if you're not doing that, you can't possibly like, effectively run a business in my opinion. And the final one is um, journaling. And journaling is a way is once, it's similar to the list but a little bit different because you're including emotion and storytelling. And so I might have a crazy day at work, um, lots of different decisions, lots that I need to evaluate and I'm not sure which direction to go. And instead of just sitting there in my head for hours thinking about exactly what I'm gonna do, start journaling and write it out, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, as you're creating a story, you kind of, your subconscious mind starts to just piece together the solution. And all of a sudden, within this journal, you've got written down, okay, I think in order to achieve this, this, and this, which I've outlined, and these kind of issues, the, the resolution, I think, is this. And all of a sudden, you've got this answer that you've just created yourself by just talking to yourself in a weird way. And then from that, then you can add that to the list of all your jobs and then continue the process. And that, for me, at least never stops. I'm always looking for, you get inputs through the day that come, and then you've got those greater vision things as well. And you need to constantly, it's constantly a battle between the, the right then and now and those grander visions. And you just need to ensure that you're always focusing on the tasks that you believe are going to lead to the most amount of success as quickly as possible. And that's where you can finish up with things like your 80-20 analysis and looking at you know, what are the 20% of things that are gonna cause 80% of the positive results? Keep focusing on that. Anything that's not part of that, ditch it or delegate. Often going slower and taking that time out to really reflect on, you know, the day or the moment or the last hour can really, really help you in the, in the short term and in the long term by just taking a break and, and giving your mind a chance to, to process. So what, what drew you to the, to the marketing industry? The marketing industry for me, it's one that offers the best of two worlds. For me, I was always quite good at the rational. I was good at mathematics, I was relatively good at science, and, but the thing was I didn't really enjoy it. I just, I just could do it. And there was this other part of me that was creative, but I was by no means an artist. I, could, I can't paint, I can't draw, but I was always like an ideas person. I did a little bit of acting, a little bit of, um, you know, I was very good at speeches and things like that, but I couldn't, at the time at least, put that into any form of art form. And, for a period there when I was going through school and even university, I didn't quite know where I wanted to go. I, and I felt like marketing was kind of the best of those two worlds because it's one that uses r rational inputs. You know, you look at, there's a lot of data analysis, there's a lot of going into like Google Analytics and seeing how things are, how things are performing and looking at sales and looking at financials. But there's also this creative component where, you know, there's that human psychology component. And that was something that I was personally very interested in. I was interested in you know, at one stage I thought about studying psychology and I was interested in the way that people think and why people do things and why people act. And marketing is in a way a form of, persu it is persuasion and it is, and it is manipulating them in a sense. But, you know, at least for me and the work that I do, I always try to work with clients and brands that I believe in um, and not do anything that's going to be negative. But I found that always really interesting. And the fact that marketing is one of those kind of jobs that there's, there are methods and there are structures to get good results, but it's still always a small gamble. You know, you can, you can make your likelihood of success very high, but it's still like this game, picking together so many different elements and trying to piece together this the really difficult puzzle. And even the very best marketers in the world can never be 100% sure this campaign is going to be work. Can work. They can be very certain or um, they can be very uh, confident but they can never be certain. And that's, for me, always fun. It's kind of like, it's like gambling where, but you can stack the cards. Um, and I just found it was a really great way of me combining that skills and analytical thinking with creativity in a way that matched my personality and matched what I was good at. And I think with the environment changing now so rapidly with the new forms of marketing tools, say in terms of analytics, but also the outputs in terms of you've got Instagram and Snapchat, LinkedIn, Facebook, countless others, needs marketers to adapt to the environment and the ones that adapt best uh, and adapt quickly are the ones that, that are going to be uh, successful 
for their clients and themselves in the long run. That's exactly right. And something that I've always been interested in and I loved is that constant learning, constant improvement, constant trying to be a better person, trying to, you know, get the level of success that I want. And exactly as you said, marketing is like that because it's always changing. So it's this game of everyone trying to, you know, the latest and greatest and the new and it's it's always evolving and, and what was what worked previously now doesn't work. So now everyone's gonna you know? And it, for me that that's fun. It makes the it means the game is always changing, which keeps the game interesting. If I was stuck at a job doing the same thing, the same process, the same mathematical formula that works, if for me and my personality, I it would just make me bored. And with marketing, I'm never bored. Um, I've always, I always find there's something new and something interesting. And the final bit which attracted me to marketing is that I've always had an interest in entrepreneurship. Mm. Uh, and at the time, I couldn't quite. I couldn't quite nail this, you know, what business I wanted to do. You know, when I was younger, I was a bit, you know, I could, I could, I was like, oh, I had a thousand and one ideas. I couldn't quite make it happen. And marketing, I, all, I always thought was the one out of all the business disciplines that most closely related to entrepreneurship, because it's not just about putting out a press ad. It's about so much more than that. It's about looking at all of your different marketing mix, your your, your price, your product, where you're positioned, your storefront, your, your staff, your how, you know how you interact. Every th every single thing you do in your business is marketing. And people often forget, you know, even just your e-signature is important. That's part of your brand. If you want to create a really strong brand, every single thing you do needs to be representative of your brand and the quality that your brand is. Um, and that's one thing I notice that some people get wrong. You know, they spend tens of uh, tens of thousands on one campaign to make it look really good, and then they've got crappy e-signatures. So you bring people in, and then all of a sudden, the, their perception of what you are and then what they get is is not the same. And you always should be delivering upon the promises that you make. Can you delve in, into a bit more about personal brand and what your recommendations are for those? I guess from a business point of view, but also from a uh, personal owner's point of view, what they can be doing to boost their personal brand in in the 2017 environment? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that more recently I've been focusing on because a lot of people have a hesitancy to start a personal brand because it's you. You know, when you start a business, it's the business and there's that element of separation. But with a personal brand, it's now everything you do is me. And it's hard sometimes to, one, let go of what you were previously and two, have the confidence to go out and, and back yourself and put your name behind everything. So instead of being able to hide behind the cloak of, you know, Joe's Coffee Shop, now it's Joe and you have to stand for that. I mean, my first recommendation for anyone looking to build a personal brand is to read, listen, watch all of Gary Vaynerchuk's media that he puts out. He puts out a lot of media and it's all very good and it's a lot about one, firstly, you just got to go out and do it. You got to produce content. And you have to realize that when you produce the content, you're opening yourself up for criticism, you're opening yourself up for a lot of positivity and also a lot of negativity. Those two things come together. You have to realize that it's all part of a, your greater mission. And I think one of the mistakes a lot of people make with a personal brand is they think, I need a personal brand, so I want to be Instagram famous. No, you don't. You, you, most likely, the reason that you want to be Instagram famous, your motivation isn't around you're trying to achieve some goal, it's because you're trying to satisfy some um, an element of insecurity. You know? right. Yeah, it really comes down to what your why is. You know, why are you doing what you're doing? And if you can articulate that, that really then holds you um, through through the long haul. Do it for the right reasons. Ex Do it for you, not for everyone, everyone else. Exactly. My roommate was a great example of someone. He's a barber, and when he opened up his barber shop, you know, he changed his whole Instagram and he's like, now I am Ryan the Barber and that he owned that brand, he owned that job, and he's having a lot of success. I think when it comes to personal branding, the mistake a lot of people make is they try to be everything for everyone. And then, they're, you know, they're one minute they're the beach girl, and next minute they're, you know, the study nerd. And, and, and that element of, 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 of the lack of authenticity is really, really easy for people to spot. And that, you know, is exactly back to your point of the why. When your why is clear, when you're clear of your mission, what you want to achieve, and who you are, personal branding becomes a lot easier. But the main thing is one, work out your why, work out who you are, work out what your objective is, and then own it. Absolutely own it. And it's taken me a long time, I'm 27 now, and only recently have I one, had the balls to go out and, and start personal branding, and two, to for me to actually work out you know, who I am, what I want, and how I want to go about doing it. And now I've even updated my Instagram um, bio, which is like a summary pretty much. You know, I'm Justin, I'm a digital marketer, I love presenting, I love lifestyle design, I love helping people achieve their goals. That's that's me. And for me, that's perfectly authentic because I know that's a fact 
and but when you go out there's always going to be haters and that's something that you, you just you deal with yeah and i think it's balancing that confidence to go out with also the humility that comes along with it mm. and balancing both can be can be, be a challenge but when you get that balance right you really start seeing returns you might not start seeing returns straight away but if you keep at it over the long long term it will pay dividends. I can't. I can't agree more. And with personal branding as well, people forget that. Like, for example, LinkedIn is a perfect way. If you're doing B two B business, you want to be on LinkedIn, and you need a strong personal brand. And I see these people that they're they're looking for a job or they're trying to start a B two B business, and they don't either a don't have a LinkedIn profile or b they have a really crappy one. It's like you're missing a huge opportunity here because that's a way of connecting with other business owners that are looking for your service and and want to meet someone. Like everyone out there has a need. They may need marketing. They may need something else. And if you present yourself in such a way that makes you, you know, if they believe in you or if they are interested in something that you say because you put out some content, you start that connection. You can build that relationship. You people are missing huge opportunities, leveraging themselves and backing themselves in whatever is their particular interest area by not activating a personal brand. So it takes a bit of courage and it's a bit hard to separate your, you know, to to go all in on it, but. It's definitely in the world of of social media. You know, we mentioned on the Reiterate podcast. You, you can't, you know, you, you can't get angry at the game. You have to play the game, and that, that that's exactly right. You can't change the. You've got to focus on what you can control in the market, what the environmental variables are, and then play to that and play to your strengths and put the time in to understand these platforms and how best to market yourself. Marketing yourself on LinkedIn, that'll be different to how you market yourself on Facebook, to Instagram, to Snapchat. But it's important to be across all those platforms yeah, it, it, to, to get your name out as well. Exactly, exactly. I think the main thing is just to remember you'll you can never be all things to all people. Just remember to be yourself, know your vision, and then it'll come. Do you find the staff that you hire? Do they have a personal brand? Is that how you find them? What's your recommendation in, in hiring staff? Sure. I mean, my biggest thing when hiring staff is hire on personality, um, then, and there's a multitude of reasons for that. You know, one of the main reasons as well is one, I want to work with people that I like working with. That's one of the advantages of being a business owner. But I think that even more important, it's so so important to have a team that work well together and that enjoy being there, and that you can leverage off each other's energy and each other's insights. I've I've seen and at times had to participate in teams where there wasn't that perfect gel, and it causes friction and it causes people to talk behind each other's backs and it can just lower the entire energy of the team and energy management and keeping people pumped and excited I, I think in my view is the most important thing so higher on how well you're going to get along with them and how long they're going to get along with all your team there are a lot of people with really you know really high skill sets you know generally if I put an ad out I'll get 150 app, you know applications so Chances are that you know there are people with very similar skill sets, but the, their attitudes are all going to be different. They're all people. They're all individuals, and I want to choose the ones that I really enjoy being around. Because you've got to spend eight, nine, ten, maybe some days, fourteen hours with them. So you want to at least there's a way to make it so that you can have a good time at work with the people that you're working with. You know, you don't need to create this stuffy office where it's all that's what they did in the 70s and 80s. This is the new age. You know, I've always had this theory: if you can't have your staff on like Facebook. Why are they your staff? Like they, they've got to be friends. And if, if you can't be honest enough to have each other on Facebook, how can you be honest enough to work in a business and a team? You know, that's that's how you get people who are stealing, you know, paper paper clips and, and staplers and stuff. In my view, the second thing, of course, is yes, you have to look at the hard skill sets and what they have and what they can contribute. That's of course important. I obviously, but back on the point of attitude, if they've got the kind of attitude where they come in and say, Justin, I'm keen to learn, I, I love the, the content that you're putting out, what can you teach me, you know, even if I don't get the job, can you recommend some books, how can I get, you know, how can I get to a level or get this kind of role, can you put me in touch, that is what I look for because that's the kind of person that I know is going to pick up what I give them and roll with it and get better and better and better and quicker than anyone else. You know, the person that you don't want to hire is the person that thinks that they already know it all. Hmm. It's because about having that growth mindset as well. If you've got an employee that wants to learn and grow, that's better for you uh, personally, better for you as for your business, as opposed to having someone who's might be has has a slightly higher skill set, but that's fixed. Mm -hmm. The person who will grow will su surpass the 
employee with that fixed mindset. Abs I can't agree more. Growth mindset's the most important thing and no ego. Mm. You know, I I, I I recognize that I have so much more to learn and that I can be so much better and I want people that recognize that as well because you've seen, the minute you get egos in there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be clashes um, and we don't want that, we want to work together as a team to get the best result and I think the, the final thing when hiring is to you know, I got this out of the personal MBA and I think it's a fantastic way and I don't know why more businesses don't do it. You know, you want to hire people, you know, some people don't interview well, they get very anxious and they don't speak very well, you know, having a conversation like this can be really difficult for them. Um, and, and perhaps their resume doesn't quite give a full, you know, indication of, of the work that they do. So you might be missing an opportunity there. So, you know, the personal MBA recommends, and this is something that I implement, is to give a small task as part of the application. So they, they apply for the job and you say, as part of your application, you know, here is an example example mock business case and you actually give them a, a role or a task that's you know what they would be doing something small something that's achievable something that's easy something that is you would need you know you obviously set your core skills that they need to have for the job so something that uses them in a small task that they can present so in the interview it's not like hi you know my name's Jason pleased to meet you you know yeah, so tell us why what, what attracted you to blah 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 well, they need a job that's you know you know that's they're silly questions and they're questions that are hard to answer and that everyone asks what's more important is like hey Jason walk in can't wait to see what you put together on your application let's you know let's chat through it and they're going to present all they're going to use all their skills to put together some type of business case that's interesting and engaging to watch that may even help your business and you get a good idea of how they're going to perform in that role and I think that really filters out then the applicants that don't want to put the effort in they'll see that the application has that core task component mm -hmm. and it'll really only be the ones that really want the job that'll actually spend the time to go through and do that task. Yeah, absolutely. I Even, you know, if you're worried about asking too much from clients, ditch the cover letter. The cover letter is also a wank. You know, it it's old and it's silly. I don't think you need it. You know, I said on mine, you even, you know, send me, send me a video of yourself. If you're not comfortable talking on camera, you know, send me a message, a personal message about something, you know, like try, tell me who you are. Don't give me this like, you know, formal, uh, you know, in the 80s style cover letter. It, it, it doesn't tell me anything that's beneficial for my use. And the other thing that I put in my application is like a, a, a core question to see whether they've read it and uh, the attention to detail. So mine was, tell me your favorite book in your application. So anyone that didn't tell me their favorite book, in the bin because you obviously attention to detail is critically important and if you can't even do that when you're looking for a job you know attention to detail is hard to teach yeah I've, I've had the same advice have that call to action on your job description mm. it'll really show to you as a as a business owner which uh, which candidates are the ones that have taken the time to read the application as opposed to the ones that are just sending out a hundred applications mm. to as many businesses as they can I and agree. playing a numbers game and that that's the thing like you know people looking for a job need to understand it's not a numbers game you know they think oh, I've sent out 150 and no one's got back to me don't send 150 send 15 to the ones you want the most but put in the time that you put in for that other hundred and something you know and that's how you get the job think of ways that you can be out of the box you know, and you, it's so easy to go out of the box these days. Like one of, the, um, well back in the day when I was going for a job, I was highly unqualified for it, but I just decided to apply anyway. And mine was a video. I, I put together this video talking, you know, to camera, which is something I knew I was good at. And you don't have to do a video, it can be anything. But for me, I was good at talking on camera. I made it kind of funny. I had jokes in there. I, and there was a few hundred applicants and I was in the top list, completely unqualified. To be fair, I didn't get the job because as we were chatting through it, they're like, Justin, we need someone with like five years experience and you have zero. So we love your application. You seem like, you know, very entrepreneurial. We're sure you'd be good at this, but we're just not quite ready for you. But the reason I got that interview was because I went through that process, you know, and I feel I get frustrated sometimes because I feel like everything we've talked about, lots of other people have talked about. People are telling you to do it and yet you still get these people that are putting 150 applications, no one's applied because of, you know, you, all you've done is change out the dear first name. What are you doing? Come on, like pick up your game. It's not hard. Yeah, it's a great way to differentiate yourself to the you know ninety eight percent of people who will do that, who will just take the the easiest option to put an application together. If you really you know spend the extra fifteen minutes, half an hour, an hour that it, it'll take to really refine your application, it can really be, be the difference between getting that interview and um, and missing out. Absolutely, invest in yourself. Put spend a hundred bucks and get your friend who's a designer to make it look really cool, and at least then your resume looks better than everyone else's. Like these are really simple things um, and I don't understand why more people don't do them.
put a photo on your resume. It's nice. People connect with people. And the final one is realize this is the 21st century. It's 2017. Your potential employer will check your Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn with your other hiring managers and they're going to go through your Instagram and potentially laugh, you know, blah, 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 blah. That happens. Don't think it doesn't happen. So option one, put everything on private and lock it off. Option two, make sure there's nothing there that's going to, you know. And, you know, I've been hiring and you look at people and you see their Instagram and you're like, I can't have this person on my team. You know, it's simple stuff. Sort of works in the reverse too. So you, as a as an employee, can then research the business, research the the owner of that business, and find out a bit more about them before going to the interview. That way, you can build up a bit more rapport before you even meet them. Absolutely. I mean, and that is that's impressive. Like people respect. Like even if you've gone to the effort to do a, just a touch of research, and you can say something insightful in the in the interview. You know, oh, you know, I saw your article that you wrote on blah blah blah. You know, boom, instantly you're. You're five points ahead of everyone. Just from, it takes five, ten minutes. It, it's super easy to do. There are so many tricks like that that uh, people uh, don't see. I mean, one example, this wasn't for hiring, but I needed some advice from a very high-level creative director. Um, and then I had no way of getting in contact with him. But all I did was I, had, I, I looked at the info line, uh, and there was like contact first name at business name. Okay, so then I looked up who was this, who was this person I want to speak to, looked him up on LinkedIn, uh, first name dot last name at business name, and then first name at business name. All of a sudden, then when I sent the email, I played off to um, his interests and I you know, told him I'm a big fan of his work, I mentioned some of the work that I liked, da, 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 got the email back with the information that I received. You know, I, and for me, I was stoked. That's, it's that easy. Just just think that little bit, little bit level deeper. I love that sort of hacking, um, hacking a little bit in, in your approach. Yeah. Spending that extra couple of minutes to try to figure out how best to get in contact with these people. Yeah, and, it's and really clever. Yeah, per, per, personalize it. If you know who the hiring manager is, you can probably find their LinkedIn. You can probably find their Facebook. You can probably find their Instagram. You can probably find out what hobbies they're interested in. And then you know, if you really want, put on your if you have any hobbies in in general, and you have that on your resume. Put them down because people want to work with people that they like. People like people that have the same hobbies as them. You're once again ahead of the crowd. And I think that's that's an important distinction. I think everyone's in the, in the people business. We're not selling a product or a service. We're really just we're selling people, people skills to other mm -hmm. people, and building that rapport is, is key. Whether it's networking, whether it's meeting new clients, it's really a great way to establish yourself and to differentiate yourself from everyone else. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Like This is one of the things I heard of someone many years ago and now it, it makes complete sense to me. There, There is a place for going out and doing Google Ads and doing Instagram and doing all of those things. Yes, you need to do that. But one of the best ways to get clients is go to a bar, start chatting to someone and all of a sudden you'll realize that they'll, they'll run a business too and they'll be having some challenges and you'll have shared challenges and you talk about them and then you, you talk about your offering and what you can do and all of a sudden over a drink at a bar when you're, you know, you're spending 10 minutes away from your friends, you've made a new lead and I, I've got sales from doing that, just from chatting to people and, and you know, being friendly, being polite and listening to them. Don't pitch to them, don't sell to them, just listen. And then if you identify, they say, oh, I'm really having trouble, Justin, you know, our current you know, website provider, they're terrible, I hate the end product we got, we got ripped off. It's like, oh man, I'm sorry to hear that, that's disappointing, of course. That's very common in marketing. There's a lot of people that claim that they're experts and unfortunately aren't. I, you know, I, you know I'd, love to, I'd love to be able to help you out. We build websites too, you know, I can show you, here's, here's some links to some ones we've done. Oh really, all of a sudden, uh, you know, you'll get an email back a few days later, Justin, you know, thank you so much. Offer free advice. It's one of the big things that I do. You know, all reiterate clients get me on board as a consultant as well. So they can email me questions and I just give them honest advice. Justin, we're thinking about it. It's like having an extra person on your marketing team. And if you do that as part of your pitch, um, not even your pitch, when you're chatting to people, listen to them and just give them advice. You know, uh, for a hundred for a hundred bucks, you know, for, for me to give you an answer, it's not worth it. I'd rather just give you that for free and you take it and if you use it, fantastic. And then hopefully, nine times out of ten, they end up coming back and using your services. So everyone wins. Now it's a great way to sort of build build up your skill base and build up your offering by offering free advice. It's just it, it it's to build trust. You know, build trust in people. You know, people want to work with people that they trust and people that they like. And that's and that's why with everything I do, I try to be absolutely transparent. I try to be open. I try to be honest at all times. And um, and that's the way you also you never get burnt either you know all my clients are happy and I hear all these stories of people have been burnt by this marketing agency and I don't believe it blah, blah 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 and it's because people are trying to be cheap they're trying to squeeze every dollar they're trying to 
they don't have enough you know subject matter knowledge to be able to properly explain things to people so they just go oh this is definitely what you need and then it doesn't work and then all of a sudden you know they go oh, and then they run away you know and I think there's a lot of people in the industry that are taking that short-term mindset, but it's really about that long-term. It's building those long-term relationships that may not pay off in, in the next year or, or two years, but in the next 10, they might be your, your biggest clients. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and even if they don't end up using you, they'll probably refer you. You know, if you've been so good to them, they'll refer to you, their friend, and all of a sudden you get an email, hey, um, one of my best mates recommended you, you know, um, I, heard, I heard you're great, I'd love to use you. And I've, I've, I've had that, and I've spent hours with people that haven't given me a cent, a cent, and I'm happy to. I actually get excited talking to these people because I get to hear about their businesses. I love talking about people doing interesting things. You know, that's one of the things I love, and I love, you know, hearing about their business and what they want to achieve and, the, and going back and forth, and it always seems to come back around. And So just focus on that. Yeah, but back to that karma, you know, you always get more than what you give. Mm -hmm. What sort of free advice do you have, I guess, as a general sense to those sort of businesses just starting out? So I guess free advice in a marketing sense, what they, what they can do, general strategies. There's a number of things. I think firstly is you need to, one, make sure, understand your brand and what you want to achieve. So if you don't understand anything about branding, start doing some research on branding. And once you have, you know, your logo and your ethos and what's important to you and your business and and you know that value proposition is often very important as well like what what is what does your business offer that makes you unique what's your unique selling proposition so when someone says yeah hey you know what do you do you can nail that one liner because that's the most important thing once you've got that then you need to have a look at your budget i see sometimes people have trouble with you know they over invest in some areas and under invest in others so firstly look at your business and then start to start to look at what you think is going to lead to the greatest returns so and for every business this is different so this it is difficult to give you know some solid advice that every listener can use so what i would recommend is as you start start analyzing what's working and what's not like i see some people pouring days into instagram and their business is you know selling freight to china you know and it's like well, that's probably not the best way to to get new customers is through Instagram. And just because the world tells you you've got to be on Instagram, it's the new platform that you know fifteen thousand marketers are using, doesn't mean it's right for your business. So you need to identify where you're, and that's what I mentioned at the start of the podcast. Do the eighty twenty. Where are what twenty percent of activities that generate eighty percent of our customers? Focus on that. Double down on that. Don't listen to you know the news article that says oh you've got to be on Snapchat. You know because that's one of the big mistakes I see a lot of business owners do. They're like oh god I just can't keep up. There's so many different platforms, so many different things I need to use. You don't need to use them all. You only need to use the ones that are relevant to your business. I mean one of the ones which is across the board is websites. You need a good website. Nearly all businesses, not all, but nearly all need a good website. So I always recommend investing in the money and having a good website. But the other thing is, this is the flip side, don't invest tens of thousands of dollars in a website if you're not going to put in the effort to drive traffic to it. There's no point, you know, there's no point having this website that no one sees. So you have to balance these things and have a strategy, okay, if you've got a brilliant website, how are we going to draw traffic to it? Um, it is a bit of a balancing act. So the main thing is talk to someone that knows what they're talking about and that you trust. So start, look for mentors, look for other people that you know are really great business people that you respect, ask them for advice. Um, that's one of the main things that I'm always doing is talking, you know, recognizing that there's a lot of people that are, are better at running businesses in different kind of areas than myself and chatting to them, talking to them, what do you do? What do you recommend? Okay, taking their advice, moving forward. They're the final ones. I mean, get a good marketing agency. <laughs> that's like, of course. But one of the other things, and this is something that I tell some clients, if, you, if you're, you know, they talk to me and they say, Justin, I don't know if I can spend $30,000 with your agency. It's, it's so much money. I so, say, okay, well... You, you know, we just had a half an hour conversation that you're, you know, the, the marketing manager that you're using doesn't seem to really, you know, generating any results for you. They're like, yeah, no, I don't know how to do that. So, okay, well, do you need the marketing manager? Oh, well, every business needs a marketing manager. Not really, you know. You're paying this marketing manager $70,000 per year and you've just told me that they're not generating you any results. I'm telling you that for $30,000 I can get you... 10,000 website hits and that your conversion rate is 5%. So from that 10,000, 5% are going to convert, which is likely based on your average sale value you're going to generate you this return. So, you know, can you see the disconnect here? And yes, it's common to have a marketing coordinator or a marketing executive marketing manager, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your business needs one. A lot of people, you know, and I don't want to bag marketing coordinators, they're fantastic 
at, at doing certain things, but they need to be, I think small businesses make the mistake of they get like someone fresh out of uni and they're the marketing manager and you're asking too much of them. They don't have the skill bases yet. And you know, marketing coordinators need someone to also have a mentor in the business. And that's what I had. And that's how I got to this level. I had a fantastic team that taught me everything I know pretty much. Uni got me to a certain level and then they, they taught me all these things and I taught myself to get to this level. So look at all your financials, look at where your money's going and look at how your money can be better spent. Everything you do in business is, is a return on investment analysis. That's all it is. So, you know, if, if we invest X, what do we get in return? And try to be really, don't buy into the hype. Don't buy into the buzzwords. Don't buy into the news articles. Really take a rational approach. Run the numbers and then see what works best for you. Or And if you don't know how to do any of that, get someone in that does. It's, wor it's worth your money. What makes Reiterate unique to all the other marketing agencies out there? I think one of the main you know elements, and we've kind of touched on it through this whole podcast, has been one of the themes. What makes us unique is the fact that you've got someone that has that, that's leading the entire operation that has done all these things. So I've, I've been the digital marketing manager for a big brand. I've done campaigns for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've been with brands that have earned millions of dollars. So I understand the role of the marketing manager. I understand the challenges of, of, of the marketing manager as well. And just be, you know, not always budget is the challenge, but there are other challenges as well that they face. And then I've now done create a reiterate and I understand the challenges of the business owner and of the you know of the small business owner I understand the the things that they have to consider when they're making decisions and I know that for some small businesses spending five ten fifteen thousand dollars is and for something that you know maybe you've been burned it's a big investment I, I understand I understand that as well from personal experience my parents also own a business so I understand you know, having a family run business, what the challenges are there. My main goal is to always create win wins, to always be transparent, to not use cookie cutter approaches, to customize everything, to make sure that I get the best end result. I mean, I'm a people person, I hate to disappoint people. I want people to believe in me, but not just believe in me, I want, I want to realize, you know, I want to thank them for their belief and give them what they want. I, I always believe that marketing should be a win win. Like, it, if, if you're losing with marketing, Someone, something is wrong. You know, the, the core of marketing is if we invest this, we get this back at some stage. And sometimes that's short term, sometimes it's incident. If it's a direct action campaign, you run some ads for three days, you know, buy a 20% off, buy now, do, 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 you get your return back, boom, end of that week, fantastic. Sometimes it's a long play, sometimes it's a branding objective. And so then you need to make sure that you've got the key performance metrics in place to understand what you know the results of success is so that's you know with me in the consultations we talk about you know what's what's your vision of success so you know with all this activity what do you want to achieve and we try to really drill down so let you know we even do some like visualization stuff so okay we we've run the campaign what's happening now talk me through it and that way truly and a lot of the times i get people come to me and say justin i need a new website we go okay all right t tell me why do you why do you think you need a new website blah 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 blah, blah. okay yeah and or oh, and then all of a sudden you find out through this this discovery process, you don't need a new website. You actually need a, a strategy to drive traffic to your website. A new website is not going to achieve that or sometimes it's the opposite. So it's a lot of the times what people think they need is often not what they need. And it's about having someone that is honest enough to be able to tell them that, have that discussion and then, and then action that. So that's probably our, our unique differentiator and other than that, I'm using, you know, a lot of agencies out there, especially the ones that are offering real cheap uh, services, are outsourcing everything to India. That's definitely an option that you can do. It's one that I could do. It's one that anyone listening to this podcast can jump on upwork.com and go get, you know, a guy to run Facebook ads. Go get a guy to, to build a website. You can do all that, and you're, you're more in your rights, you're absolutely in your rights to do that. What I also find is I get lots of people that have gone out and done that, and then they've been burnt one, for one reason or another. They spent hundreds of dollars and got nothing, or their website's gone down. Uh, and a lot of agencies are doing that as well, and that's where the, you get these poor quality outputs, things are clunky, and I chose when I was starting Reiterate, I said, no, I want to work with only people that I've worked with in my career in marketing that I trust, that I know can do amazing work, and I'm only going to work with them. And as a business owner, that, that has a huge premium for me. I, I pay a lot of money for that. But we get really great outputs and people that I can trust, and we do it fast and we do it well. That's the main thing. I think there are also one of the differentiators is you, we're a whole team dedicated to staying up to date with, with the entire industry. And there's a, some agencies that are kind of like, oh, you know, no, nah, we, we, we just do it this way. And then they hire some 20 year old that's 
supposedly an expert that's not no she's in charge of the social media and he's in charge of the the google adwords and if you talk to one person they don't know and that's not how i like to operate it either i want the entire team is involved in everything that we do and i think you know i like to think we're a bit of fun to work with as well you know we try to keep things light oh, that's great great having that customer centric approach and having the customer at the at the core of your your business and your business model really understanding how to deliver value to them and from then then tailoring the solutions to to what their business needs as opposed to the opposite of what taking the opposite approach and and applying a cookie cutter methodology mm -hmm. yeah, which is certainly definitely outdated these days Justin, exactly right just want to say thanks so much for um for uh, being on the podcast number one great to have your your perspective on the whole marketing industry and hope to hope to keep giving contact so thanks so much absolutely look forward to it thank you so much for listening would really appreciate it if you left a rating for more inspiring stories and advice follow stories behind the grind on instagram and facebook